Hey everyone and welcome to another HSE revision lecture for chemistry. In this video we'll be going through the second module, the acidic environment. We've already released videos on production of materials and we'll be releasing videos on each of the other core topics as well as a general study tips video to go through, I guess, how you should be preparing for chemistry and how you should approach the final exam. We're releasing these videos for a whole range of subjects, um, and whilst we can't obviously go through absolutely every dot point and every point of content, we're doing our best to smash through the content in as quickly as possible. Hopefully the video will be about 15 minutes. Um, if you ever need more help or support, make sure to check out our course notes, which you can buy online for $25 at 8hanotes.com. Uh, let's get started on the acidic environment. Cool, so it's pretty important that you know, I guess, the, the pHs of several substances um, and whether they are acidic, basic, or neutral. The pH, sorry, the pH isn't so relevant, um, but you need to know which pHs are acidic, basic, or neutral, and also which substances are acidic, basic, and neutral. So these are just some common examples that come up in like HSC multiple choices. Question might be something like, which of the following lists contain only acidic solutions? Um, and you need to be able to just look through and say, oh, well, this one's neutral, or oh, this one's basic, so the only answer could be C. Um, so these are just some examples of um, acidic, basic, or neutral properties of typical chemicals that are asked. You need to know the indicators. You need to know the indicators and their endpoints. So you need to know that methyl orange changes colors at a pH of about four, that bromothiamol blue changes colors at about seven, and that phenethylene or phenophthalene changes colors at about eight and a half or nine. In terms of our indicator uses, there are two that are commonly asked. Where you, it's used to test the pH of water, so in pools and lakes. Uh, we use a universal indicator because that's the just the easiest indicator to use. We can check whether water is toxic to human or marine life. And we can do that really quickly. So it's really beneficial that we have the ability to just drop some stuff in water and see the pH, because then we can quickly see that there is some sort of pollutant and we can try and resolve the issue. Um, checking the pH of soil is a bit more difficult, mainly because soil is black and a solid. So we dissolve some soil in water. We add some white barium sulfate powder on top, which doesn't react and just acts as sort of a white backdrop. We add some universal indicator and we can easily determine the color and therefore pH of the soil. This affects crop growth and can be affected by things like water concentration or water pH, uh, acid rain, leaking, that sort of thing. So then there's a dot point about oxides. It's important you can just quickly cite off some examples of acidic oxides and some basic oxides. You can see that the non-metals are typically um, acidic oxides, whereas the metals are um, typically form basic oxides. The most common examples of acidic oxides are things like sulfur, trioxide, carbon dioxide. Um, so you can just pick one and show that the sulfur trioxide, whilst isn't, so an oxide isn't in and of itself acidic, but it, it is an ex acidic oxide because when it forms an it forms an acid with water. So as you can see in the equation in the bottom right, when you mix sulfur trioxide with H2O, it forms H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid. Now, Le Chatelier's principle. If you ever get a Le Chatelier's principle, you must start with a sentence that describes Le Chatelier's principle. When a system at equilibrium is introduced to a change, the equilibrium will shift to minimize that change. That's the sentence that I used. You might have something slightly different, but it's super important that you define Le Chatelier's principle at the start of any Le Chatelier's principle question. There are three components of Le Chatelier's principle that we're interested in, and the first of those is temperature. You need to know that an endothermic reaction consumes energy during the forward reaction, and an exothermic reaction releases energy during the for forward reaction. Now, the delta H values, I, it took me a long time to really understand what they mean, but they're actually quite simple. So in an exothermic reaction, when the substance moves from the reactant to the product phase, it releases energy. That means that the substance itself has lost energy. Its internal energy has gone down, which means that the delta H value is negative. That's all the delta H value means. It's the energy of the particular substance. So let's look at what happens when there's an increase in temperature. If there's an increase in temperature, the system, by Le Chatelier's principle, will try to decrease the temperature. 
Now an endothermic reaction consumes energy during the forward reaction and so will shift to the right in this case because it'll absorb the additional energy due to the increase in temperature. However, an exothermic reaction will shift to the left. If it were to shift to the right, it would be releasing more energy, which would increase the temperature even further. So it's going to shift to the left to absorb that extra energy due to the increase in temperature. Here's just an example for the carbon dioxide. You probably know this off by heart by now. Now we look at concentration. If we increase the concentration of the products, we'll shift towards the reactants. And if we increase the concentration of the reaction, reactants, we shift towards the products. Again, that's just a basic, basic um, example of Le Chatelier's principle. Because we're adding one thing, it, the system tries to decrease the concentration of that thing by shifting to, towards the other side. So if we look at this example here, if we increase some sort, if we add some sort of acid, that means we're adding hydrogen ions in effect, which means we're increasing the concentration of the right hand side. So if we increase acid, it'll shift to the left. If we add a base, then the hydrogen ions on the right hand side will be neutralized. So we're decreasing the concentration on the right hand side. So the system will shift towards the right to make up for that decrease in concentration. Pressure has to do with gases and only gases. If you increase in pressure, if you cause an increase in pressure, a shift to the side of with fewer moles of gases will occur. A decrease in pressure will cause a shift to the side with more moles of gases. This is because all gases occupy the same volume. And so if you decrease, if you increase the pressure, it's going to want to occupy the least amount of volume, which will shift to the side with the least moles of gases. So taking the example here, which is the Haber process, we can see that the right hand side has fewer moles of gas. So an increase in pressure will cause a shift to the right and a decrease in pressure will cause a shift to the left. We'll just quickly now look at a common example. We have two gases X and Y forming a third gas Z. Uh, we want to find the highest yield of Z. Now we know that there are more moles of gas on the right hand side than the left. So we want the pressure to be low so that we can shift the equilibrium towards the right. So the answer is either A or C. We also know that the reaction is endothermic because the substances absorb heat when they move forward, which means that you want to have high temperatures. So the answer here is going to be C. OK, let's look at poisonous oxides. There are two oxides that we're interested in, sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxides. It's important that you know some chemical equations for the formation of these oxides and where they come from. So we know that by smelting sulfide minerals, we release sulfur dioxide and also by combustion of fuel impurities. We know that nitrous oxides are produced in lightning um, due to lightning or bacterial growth. Um, and here are some equations that um, can show where these oxides come from. I think it's really important as an additional detail to have these sorts of equations. You don't necessarily need both of them. Obviously, if you want to choose one of the sulfur dioxide equations, you'll be choosing the second one because it's super easy. Um, but again, I would just strongly recommend having details like this. Now, acid rain is when these sulfuric oxides and nitrous oxides mix with water and form sulfuric acid or nitrous acid or nitric acid. Um, the effect of acid rains are just generally bad. They can erode buildings and land. They can incre increase the acidity of soil, which kills crops, and they can acidify waterways from which humans drink and marine life live. Uh, so obviously acid rain is just all around a bad thing. Now let's quickly look at the definitions of acids, which for some reason come very far in the curriculum. So we start with Lavoisier. He was um, the person who actually realized that elements were their own thing. He found oxygen. Well, he was the first to, I guess, synthesize pure oxygen and realize that oxygen was an, a discrete element. Um, so, of course, it being the only thing he knew, he said that acids must contain oxygen, and he was wrong. Davy noticed that hydrogen chloride didn't contain oxygen and said that, well, look, there just has to be some sort of hydrogen, replaceable hydrogen. Arrhenius added that the acids need to ionize in water to produce hydrogen atoms, and bases ionize in water to produce hydroxide. This definition is, like, basically covers the board. It's almost completely true. But the bronsted lowry definition is much more advanced. It says the acids are proton donors and bases are protons accept proton acceptors, where a proton here is just a hydrogen ion. 
So you need to know these four definitions and who they um, were made by. As an example of a bronsted lowery acid, you can see in the top one, hydrogen chloride um, donates a hydrogen ion to water, whereas in the bottom one, the ammonia donate um, gains a hydrogen atom from the water. Um, it also shows the amphiprotic nature of water because it can both donate and accept a proton. So terminology now, a strong and weak acid is just um, an acid that either completely ionizes in water or does not completely ionize in water. You need to know that some acids are strong and some acids are weak. So for instance, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, uh, hydrochloric acid are strong. Uh, and also a concentrated acid is just, just has a high concentration of hydrogen ions. A dilute acid has a low concentration. Here are some examples. So now we look at calculations. <clears throat> you need to know that C equals N over V. Over v. Concentration is moles per litre. And that moles is mass over molar mass. You also need to know that the pH of a substance is the negative log of the concentration of hydrogen ions. These formulas should be very, very familiar with, to you by now. Here's a standard example. I'm not going to go through it in the video, but I'd suggest pausing it now, doing the question, and then continuing to watch to make sure that you got the answer right. This is a very standard, very typical question. If you're not comfortable doing this sort of question, you need you found your weakness. It's mathematics questions like this. Keep an eye out for our study, um, our study video because that's going to contain tips to doing maths questions, but that's where you should focus your attention. To calculate the pH of the solution, we know that the concentration is going to be 0.26. Um, but obviously it's a base, so the pH just gives us 0.585. That's not correct. Instead, we have to use 14 minus the pH because we're actually what we found is in the pOH, which is different to the pH. So we just use the standard pH scale and subtract what we found from 14 to get 13.6. That looks like to me it should actually be 13.4, but you get the idea. Okay, titration. I think that's the last um, topic. No, there's also a serification. So titration is used to discover the concentration of an unknown solution. It requires the solution of a known concentration, which we call a standard solution, and a knowledge of the two solutions in terms of their chemical composition. So here are the steps. Hopefully you can read that. Here are the steps for the creation of a standard solution and the generally accepted methodology of a titration, including the washing techniques. Read through it, make sure you are comfortable with it, make sure you can write it out in an exam paper because that's really, really important. So when thinking about the creation of a standard solution, we need to consider whether the substance is water soluble, whether it's pure, so we actually know that we get what we plan to get, whether it has a known chemical formula so that we can find the chemical equation, whether it's hydrophobic, because if it's not hydrophobic, it absorbs water from the atmosphere, which means the mass changes over time. And if the mass changes over time, we can't accurately determine the concentration. It's also important that the substance is stable, i.e. it doesn't explode when it interacts with air. We need to be able to identify the relevant indicators. So a strong acid and a strong base will be using bromothymol blue. A strong acid and a weak base will be using methyl orange. And a strong base and a weak acid will be using phenolphthalein. Here's the basic setup for the actual experiment. You've got a burette with a base. Usually you've got a flask with a acid and you drop the base into the acid until you wait for the color to change wait for the usually wait about 30 seconds make sure the color doesn't change back and if not you've reached your end point now again these calculations you should be very very familiar with we've got a 1.1 mole per liter sodium hydroxide solution against hydro hydrochloric acid um, on average 25 mils of standard requires 27.8 mils of titer what is the concentration of hydrochloric acid solution? 
So first, we always write out the relevant chemical equation. This is the easiest chemical equation. Hopefully, you're super comfortable with it by now. An acid plus a base produces a salt and water. Thankfully, this reaction is one to one to one to one, so we don't need to think about weird mole of stuff. Remember that if one mole of something requires two moles of something else, you need to factor that into your calculations. Now we calculate the number of moles of standard solution. We can do that easily with C equals N over V. We know that there'll be equal number of moles of hydrochloric acid. So we can literally just say that, well, the ratio is one to one, so the same number of moles of hydrochloric acid exist. Finally, we can find the concentration again using C equals N over V. And there we go, 0.99 moles per liter. Easy. Okay, now we move on to the end, which is esterification. You need to know the definition of an alkanol, the chemical formula of which is CnH2n plus 1OH, and an alkanoic acid. Again, you can see the formulas there. When these two compounds react, they form an ester. So the naming component, um, the nomenclature for um, carbon alkanols and alkanoic acids are as follows. It's really important that you know these um, because you need to be able to, potentially you'll be, need to be able to identify them. So you should know the meth, eth, prop, but, all the way up to eight, to oct. So you need to be able to name a corresponding ester from an alkanol and an alkanoic acid. So as an example, methanol and hexanoic acid produce me methyl hexanoate. You know that the hexanoate part comes from hexanoic acid because I, I just think of it as like the weird one becomes the hexanoate and the normal one becomes the methyl. Up to you how you want to think about it. But that's also how you can figure out how to draw the thing. Um, the alkanoic acid has a double bonded oxygen. So you look for the double bonded oxygen and know that that one is the alkanoic acid. So here, you know that the oxygen is where the two compounds interact. So on the left-hand side, we have a methyl and an ethanoate because there are two carbons with regards to the one bonded with the double bonded oxygen. Whereas on the right, we have ethyl propanoate. Here is a bit, a bit of a summary of the um, esterification prac. This is how you should draw it. These are the um, risk assessments you should be considering. When drawing out a risk assessment, I would recommend having risk precaution response, where precaution is how you avoid the risk eventuating and response is what happens if it does. Um, the whole point of esterification is really just to show you that there are risks associated with chemistry. So I would know all five of the um, potential issues that are displayed on the slide. That's it for the acidic environment. Thanks for listening, guys. I hope you learned something. I hope that um, we managed to cover a decent amount of the content. As always, if you've ever got any questions, chuck them up on atonites.com. It's totally free to ask your questions and we'll answer them any time of day um, for any of your subjects. Keep an eye out for all of our other videos. We still have several more chemistry videos to come um, and we are releasing them and have released them for a huge range of subjects. Uh, best of luck in your study for chemistry and I will see you next time.